everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Dance Talk Realness, a podcast where we discuss all nuances concerning education and dance, because a dance experience is an experience worth talking about. I'm your host, Truly B, and I'm joined by my awesome co-host, Daryl P, and our lovely guest, Miss Alice Blumenthal. Thank you for joining us again. I'm so happy Thank to have you back. on. So... Today, we are going to be picking Alice's brain about flamenco because I am not well-versed, and she is. <laughs> um, for anyone who has had the opportunity to see her, she's amazing. So if you haven't, you need to get on top of it. So we will make sure that we have um, information where you can catch up with her and see what all she's working on. Before we jump into the conversation, though, today's quote is from J.R.R. Tolkien from the Fellowship of the Ring. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Y'all know me, I'm a nerd, me and these books. (laughs) We're gonna be on this for a while. Sorry, not sorry. All right, so Alice, I know um, the last time we had you on, you were able to give like a, a little brief synopsis of yourself but today it's all about you sis so <laughs> you can give I don't know an extended bio we'll say um especially how you were introduced to flamenco and what projects you've worked on what you're working on currently and plans moving forward Awesome. Okay. So I, like many dancers, started with ballet when I was three in a studio. Um, And then I was in middle school and was kind of bored of ballet and uh, a bit rebellious and probably very difficult to to my parents um, and my teachers. But I think what I really needed was a way to express myself that ballet wasn't at that time giving me. Uh, And I happened to stumble on flamenco in that moment in my life. One of my ballet teachers also did flamenco. uh, So that's kind of how I found it. And I just, I fell in love with it. And I was very fortunate to grow up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, really immersed in flamenco culture. It's one of the biggest hubs of flamenco outside of Spain. Uh, There's a huge festival there every summer. Um, Artists from all over the world come and perform and you get to interact with the artists and take workshops um, and and really just be immersed in flamenco culture. So that's that's really how I got into it. And then um, I decided to go to New York for college and... I thought, I thought flamenco would become a hobby, you know, it would just be something I did on the side. I was going to get my degree in comparative literature. Yay, book nerds. Um, <laughs> and then, but everything I did in New York was like, well, how can I dance more? How can I learn more about flamenco? How can, I was just so hungry to get more experience in flamenco. So every decision I made was really, how, how can I get more from dance and from flamenco? Um, but it was, it was really scary to kind of admit to myself, I wanted to pursue a career in dance. Um, and, and I think part of it was just like, I I wasn't ready to admit that to myself or anyone else. Um, so then, uh, when I graduated, I got a grant, a Fulbright grant to go to Spain for a year, um, and study flamenco. And I still, I think at that point, I still wasn't sure, like, if I was going to do this professionally, even though I'd been doing it professionally while I was in college, um, doing lots of gigs, working with some companies in the city. Um, I uh, performed at the Philadelphia Flamenco Festival, um, which really opened me up to more experimental flamenco. But I still like hadn't fully admitted I was going to pursue this professionally. Um, and then when I finished my time in Spain with a Fulbright grant, um, I was offered a spot with a touring flamenco company with Flamenco Vivo. Um, so that kind of was my, like, okay, I'm doing this. I'm going to be on the road just dancing flamenco. Um, and so I did, I toured with Flamenco Vivo for a few years, and I was a soloist with their New York-based company. But um, I'll say after my first tour, I was kind of bummed out. Touring life was not the, like, glittery life I dreamed of, you know? <laughs> Like, I dreamed, like, I'm going to travel the country dancing flamenco, and it's going to be the best thing in the world. And there are aspects of touring that I I love, and the experiences I got with Flamenco Vivo were wonderful, but I still was hungry for more. And my um, thesis advisor um, from my undergrad 
was she was a Spanish professor, um, but she had danced in Lucinda Child's company. And I mm-hmm. came back to New York um, after the first tour with Flamenco Vivo, and I was just kind of talking to her about it and my experience. And she just like. I don't know. It it didn't. It wasn't like a big thing when she said it, but I kept running it through my head. She was like, "Well, why don't you get your MFA?" And I was like, "I can't do that. I'm a flamenco dancer. My undergraduate degree is in comparative literature. How could I get an MFA? Like, mm-hmm. that's not possible for me, right?" Um, but I like she planted the seed, and so a couple of years later, um, I enrolled at Holland, where I met Julie. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Um, And that really, like, opened me up to a lot more possibility in dance and in flamenco. And so then it was in the middle of my MFA that I quit dancing with Flamenco Vivo, um, thought I might move to Spain, kind of tried that out for a few months, was like, no, this isn't what I want to do. I really want to start my own company. So I moved back to Albuquerque and started Abre Paso Flamenco, and we had three evening length shows in two years while I was there. Um, and then I moved to Ohio to take a job at Oberlin, a visiting position at Oberlin. And I completed that this year, but I'm going to stick around the Cleveland area and try and grow the flamenco scene here, which is is not easy because most people have no idea what flamenco is. So... That's kind of my challenge right now, how to how to build a flamenco scene in a city where there there really isn't much um, flamenco. So that's in a in a big nutshell. <laughs> life. <laughs> so, right, so Daryl, I will let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Um there's so much. I was just kind of like, just like, just listening. And I'm just like, wow. Just, and then I, you would say something and I would like think, oh my God, could I have done that? Would I have done that? That is so, <laughs> that's so cool. Um, tell us a little bit more about like, um, just the, what flamenco, like what were some of the connections from your previous training that you found in um, flamenco, either things that kind of drew you more to it or things that maybe th- drew you more closer, like away from like maybe the traditional training, like what was it that um, kind of gave you that connection? Yeah, um, so there, I feel like there's a few things packed into that. So kind of, I'll, I'll look at that in a couple of different ways. So I yeah. have base in, in ballet, I did the Chiquetti Method ballet, I was like, really gung-ho about ballet for, for my childhood. Yeah. Um, and that, that gave me a huge step up in the flamenco world, especially outside of Spain, uh, because in the U.S., most people come to flamenco as adults. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't have a lot of dance experience. Maybe they take a semester of it in college. That's where a lot of people, I think, encounter it. Um, so I have this base in in movement um, that a lot of flamenco dancers don't have. So that has allowed me, um, allowed my vocabulary within flamenco to be very broad. Um, And I think just gives like artistically, choreographically, um, drawing from that training and from contemporary dance training, I've been able to build my own style. Um, and then within flamenco, even, even outside of the like influence I have from ballet and contemporary dance, Inside flamenco, there's sort of the more traditional flamenco um, that has a a particular aesthetic that's really based on the improvisational structures with musicians. Uh, And then there's the more avant-garde flamenco that incorporates a lot of choreographic frameworks and processes from from contemporary dance and postmodern dance and things like that. Um, And so that... I got a lot of that at Holland's, um, just really exploring other other ways to make movement other than the sort of musical structures that flamenco has built into it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, and I was I was also open up to that working with a woman named Rosario Toledo um, when I danced in the Philly Festival. And so my my company's aesthetic and the theater works we do are are really more on the avant garde side and and conceptual based works and I usually start with a question or an idea um, rather than just kind of mounting traditional flamenco pieces although 
that's also kind of my base for the more contemporary flamenco. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> no, no, yeah, that, that's it. All right, so in the kind of piggybacking off of that, in the process, y'all, there's just so much happening outside of this window in this moment. It is amazing how disrespectful people are around here. Nobody was outside until right now. Um, But when you're looking at the um, creation process, and I do remember like some, like you spending a lot of time while we were at Holland's kind of working through, okay, but how can I do this? differently like what is another way of looking at that um when you are i guess introducing people to flamenco how do you interweave that um that internal information that you have where you're not let's say you're not stuck in what is the traditional form you're able to have more variety. So how does that impact how you introduce others to it? Yes. So um, I definitely draw from sort of both both directions. So um, I think kind of what happens in, in flamenco education, even within Spain, but also especially outside of Spain, um, is people learn flamenco from the outside in and they just imitate the shapes and the motions and they're not understanding the meaning um, behind the movements. There's specific movements we have um, that are really just like musical cues. I'm cueing that we're moving on to a new section of the dance with certain movements um, or I'm cueing the end of this section. Um, So there's a musical meaning to the movements and so they have to understand that what those are um, that I'm not just doing a big motion with my arms because that looks nice. Um, But there's actually a communicative element to it with the live musicians. So I I teach that from from the beginning. I don't just teach the steps, but also like what function does this step serve uh, choreographically? And then also what are the cultural roots of flamenco that we're not just learning steps um, and we know they're in this form called flamenco, but who are the people that created this dance form? And, and that, um, I think, often gets left out, especially with kind of the flashy stereotypes of flamenco. Um, people latch on to the image without knowing the history behind it. So um, when I teach flamenco in, in a college level class, especially um, even if it's a dance and movement class, giving them readings so they're learning about um, the pretty complex history of, of flamenco, the politics that have shaped flamenco, um, there's uh, a lot of different marginalized groups um, that influenced flamenco. Um, Franco, a dictator, uh, the dictator in Spain from the 30s to the 70s, the way that he used flamenco for political and economic means. They have to know all of these things um, if they're going to do the dance. Other, otherwise, to me, then, then it's cultural appropriation. If you're just taking the steps without knowing the meaning embedded in them, the meaning that shaped Um, the history that shaped the form. But then um, to get them to sort of make the steps their own, that they're not um, just making the shapes and okay, I know this is the step that calls the next section of the dance, but how do they really start to perform that? And so that's where I draw from um, more, uh, I mean, this is so broad. What does that mean? A postmodern approach or contemporary approach. But I'll give you a couple examples um, that I I incorporate. So um, last year at Oberlin in my intro to flamenco class, the students learned a really difficult style in flamenco called solea, which comes from the word for loneliness um, in Spanish. And it's it's very intense. It's very slow. The rhythm is very drawn out. Um, There's kind of, it's like this slow build of tension and then these like, big explosive percussive uh, moments and so they were they were learning the steps and and they knew the musical functions of different steps but they just weren't it wasn't theirs yet and so um, there are a few different things that I did one was I had them bring in either a poem or a photo or a painting that for them represented what loneliness and solitude was Um, and did some improvisation activities with scores based on the images or the poetry that they had brought in. So they were taking their own human experience of of loneliness that we all have, regardless of what culture or where we're from, 
um, and sort of exploring that on their own, what it means to them um, through their own improvised movement. And then taking that experience um, and sort of embedding it back into the flamenco choreography that they had learned. Um, so kind of two, two ways of giving meaning to the steps, the, or three ways, I guess. Um, the musical meaning, the musical structural meaning, the historical meaning, and then their own personal feelings um, and imbuing it with their own personal feelings and experiences um, and acknowledging those experiences. Um, so that was one activity I did. Um, we did, what else did we do? We did a lot of, a lot of use of improvisation and kind of embodied responses, um, that sort of paralleled what the flamenco style was getting at. Um, so they could experience that in something they're more familiar with and then take that back into flamenco. So that, that's one way that I've worked with that. Um, but I'll also say, um, it's a... Like there's a lot of movement in in the contemporary dance fields um, for like community based workshops and that kind of thing and um, like Bill T Jones's work was still here and and that type of work and sometimes I try and incorporate that into workshops I teach in the community but sometimes I'm like flamenco already has all of this built in it like automatically builds community um, we don't need to sort of superficially do that. Um, it, it automatically has space for self-expression. And so um, when I teach a lot of flamenco workshops in community settings, it's, it's about um, showing them what flamenco is and allowing them to experience that. Um, so, so even, for example, um, similar to like a cipher in, in a hip hop battle, um, uh, there's a, you're surrounded by this circle of people who are cheering you on, and there's a certain energy to that. And flamenco also has that. In, in flamenco jams, you're in a circle. And so even just the formation of, of being surrounded by people um, and that support that you're given, uh, support and encouragement, is so present in flamenco and, and the cheers that are shouted. And so to teach the students that, they're, they're creating community even just from that simple act of making the circle and cheering each other on. Um, so that's, that's kind of one thing I, I always kind of struggle with is like, when do I want to incorporate these postmodern contemporary frameworks and when is flamenco enough? And I think many times flamenco is enough just as it is. Um, and, and that's kind of another approach of mine, I guess. Cool. Do you think, um... What do you think? When you were in Spain and you were studying uh, flamenco, did you find that the community there was accepting of, of most people that would come in and want to learn this? Like, I feel like maybe there might be some dance forms that are very sacred to um, a community and a culture and that, not that they like to keep them close, because I, I feel like in, in, even in my history of going to, you know, dance conventions or, 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 uh, conferences, I've been able to learn a lot of different dance forms uh, from people who have who have so openly shared. Um, but there is, but even in those instances, there's almost this like this preciousness that they have with this. Like even for people who might not be of the from that culture or from that race of where that dance came from, there's still so much that they hold in that. But like being that you went to the source. You know, and like, and you actually got to engage in a community that like, this is our dance. Did you still feel a part of, of that? Yes. So that's, it's a, that's kind of, it, it, that's going to be a long answer. <laughs> um, so in Spain, there's actually a lot of foreigners, people from all over the world studying flamenco and yeah. Um, and there's foreigners that are professionals there. Um, it's not just people coming to study. There are people that have moved there um, and, mm -hmm. and are very much embedded in, in the source now. Mm -hmm. um, they've lived there for decades, even, some of them. Mm -hmm. um, so flamenco within Spain right now is, is very, like, multinational. People of all different backgrounds all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and... So in that way, it's very open and very accepting. Um, and it's really about how well do you dance? Um, no one really cares where you're from, um, but do you understand the musical codes of flamenco? Um, are you, I think what, what 
helps you helps to be accepted into flamenco is that you are yourself that you're not imitating someone else you're not just a copy um of other dancers but that you you understand flamenco as the language and and the codes within it so much so that you're able to just tell your story through those movements um so um that was my experience i will say that i have known people who have had a less welcoming experience i think in the last 10 years flamenco has opened up tremendously it was very closed off to foreigners mm. um and it has opened up more and more i have a i have a really close friend who um moved to spain i don't know maybe 10 years before i was there um she has very blonde hair had a very different experience than i did i i was pretty much fluent when i arrived in spain in spanish um i look spanish um so I, I fit in in that way, which made it easier for me. Um, but I think, like, especially the last, the last several years, flamenco has opened up tremendously. Um, but it's, it's a really complicated relationship because um, in some ways, flamenco may have died out without the interest of foreigners or outsiders. Mm. So... Um, flamenco was a folk art form. It was something, you know, sung at family gatherings. Um, a, a lot of the songs come from different trades. Uh, the blacksmiths had a song that they would sing. The miners would sing a song um, when they were threshing wheat um, in the fields. There's a song in flamenco that comes from that. Mm. So it, a lot of the songs come from the working classes um, in, in Southern Spain. And it was, you know, it was just, that's just what they did to pass the time or to celebrate. Um, and then it started to become a performing art uh, in the 1800s. And one of the ways it sort of, one of the steps to become a full performing art was um, these sort of very wealthy um, uh, upper class Spaniards uh, would pay um, people to sing these folk songs at their parties. Um, so that's sort of, that was kind of one step in the professionalization of, of flamenco and, and coming from folk, arm to, folk form to uh, performing arts. Um, and there's even, there's even more complexity too um, with the Gitano, the Spanish Roma people. So flamenco is, is kind of a hybrid already. It's not just um, a lot of people think it's just the Gitano people and it's entirely theirs, but there's Roma people throughout Europe and we don't have flamenco everywhere. Um, it was it was the Roma people, their songs that also mixed with these folk songs uh, in southern Spain, particularly uh, southern Spain being one of the poorer regions of Spain, very agricultural. Um, so lots of different sort of factions, I guess you could call them that, of um, of the lower rungs of society in the 1800s. Um, there are different folk songs mixing. Um, and there's there's this constant question in flamenco of, you know, do you have to be Gitano, a Roma person, to for it to be pure flamenco? Or do you have to be from Andalusia, southern Spain, for it to be pure flamenco? And then outside of Spain, do you have to be from Spain to really be authentic? Mm. Um, and so... That, that kind of dialogue and question is always always present, I think, in the background in flamenco. Um, but as it's become more and more universal and, and more globalized, I think what, what has become more of a concern is, are the people that say they're doing flamenco really doing flamenco? Do they understand the musical codes? Do they know the mm -hmm. cultural history? Um, are they just imitating something without knowing the meaning? So mm -hmm. that, I think... To me, that's the more important question. And, and um, within that, you have to recognize, you know, the Gitano influence um, within that and that kind of thing. Um, so that, that to me, I think has started to come, become sort of the larger question is, is, mm -hmm. are, is what you're doing really flamenco? Do you really know what flamenco is um, if yeah. you claim to be doing it? But then within that, who's, who's the authority to decide what's flamenco or what's not? Mm. And I think a big answer to that is, you know, are you able to improvise? If you're thrown into a flamenco jam, 
can you can you hold your own? Do you know the codes, um, the musical codes to be able to improvise? Yeah. Um, do you know um, and are you able to really express yourself within those codes? Yeah. So I would say um, because I was actually leading into perfectly <laughs> what one of my questions is, is that idea of purity of a form and I guess stateside, because that's where you're housed currently. <laughs> um, do do you feel like there's more conversation kind of around the authenticity of movement or, you know, do they really know what they're doing? Have they really studied? Do they know the codes? Do they know the history? Or do you feel that it's maybe even amount of discussion regardless of location globally? I think it's definitely more present outside of Spain uh, because within Spain, um, there's enough good flamenco and really high caliber flamenco um, that sort of the people, people know what's I mean, good is subjective. That's a terrible word to use, but um, sort of people people know enough about flamenco to know when someone knows or when they don't. And you, in the U.S., um, people don't necessarily know enough. I, I believe in audiences that they can they can tell the difference whether or not they've seen flamenco or know anything about flamenco. Um, that they they can they can tell when someone is faking it or not. I think I, I really, I don't want to underestimate audiences. I believe in, in general, the general public, that they, they can do that. But um, at the same time, um, if, you, if you don't know and someone has a big, beautiful costume and, and they write a great bio, um, how, how would someone know or not know that they know their stuff. Um, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, if you, if someone says they're fluent in, in, I don't know, Russian and you don't know Russian and they start talking and it sounds like Russian, you're like, yeah, they're fluent in Russian, but maybe a real Russian person would be like, they're just making noises mm -hmm. and it sounds like Russian. <laughs> like, I like that sounds extreme, but I've definitely seen that in the US people who just think like, oh, I can get the costume and like they just stomp their feet and do some movements with their hands and that's flamenco. So I'm going to do that. And that's all there is to it. So I think sort of ignorance is what makes space for for there to be um, people saying they're flamenco that aren't flamenco. Um, but even, and this is what frustrates me about the flamenco world in the United States, even within the people that know, there's all this like cattiness of like, well, this person, you know, this person only studied this and this person blah, 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 and, and everyone's really territorial and I just feel like we could build so much more in flamenco in the United States if we were working together and building each other up and knowing like we're all on our flamenco journeys and maybe that person knows something I don't know and I know something that they don't know. And if we shared, we could just, flamenco could flourish in a whole new way. Um, that kind of frustrates me about flamenco in the U.S. And the other thing that... I've noticed kind of along those lines is um, I think people outside of Spain and in the U S are afraid, are afraid to be themselves in flamenco. Um, and they're always sort of comparing themselves to people in Spain. Um, and I think that like, I wish more flamencos were more daring daring enough to be themselves outside of Spain and take that risk um, rather than feel like they're constrained to um, a particular image of flamenco, if that, if that makes sense. I was, I was talking with a, um, mm -hmm. a friend of mine who's a guitarist, a friend and mentor, um, and she was she's told me how she 
only in like she's I think 50 or in her early 50s and she was saying only in the last like 10 years has she finally felt like it she gave herself permission to compose music in flamenco um and it wasn't I mean she could, always could have done it she's an incredible musician um but it was more this well I'm not Spanish so I, I can't compose something in flamenco and and so I was kind of the opposite. I was like, always, I got to make this my own. I got to be different. I always wanted to be different. So like from the get go, I was always trying to find my own voice in flamenco. And I, um, I think growing up in New Mexico where I was totally saturated in flamenco and, and there really is a flamenco culture there. Um, I didn't feel that like need to compare myself constantly. Cause I had the support of, of a flamenco community. Um, and supported in in um, my personal expression within the form. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, it's kind of like this balance. When, when are you, when do you know enough that you can create your own thing? Um, but I, I, I would like to see more people that kind of do both simultaneously, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. and, and always just knowing where you stand, like, um, not being afraid to say, you know, I don't know what this part of flamenco music is, or I don't know that bit of history. Someone tell me. And I think that people are afraid to say they don't know um, for, for fear of, of um, like being called out or something. But like, nobody knows everything about everything. So mm -hmm. like, if we don't ask questions and ask for help, how are we like, then you're just going to keep faking it. You're never going to make it. So that's, that's my thoughts on that yeah no and that makes that makes perfect sense too because we just had a conversation on here recently about um about perfection right and like i wonder if why people don't take risks in flamenco is because they want they want to be perfect in in the in the movement and then and in the steps and in and then the expression of it that there's maybe fear that it it's I don't know just maybe just fear in general you know either personally just like I feel like I won't do it justice or that I like you were saying don't know enough I mean they feel like they don't know enough to really go on that out on that limb of maybe being imperfect in 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 that so so that's that's interesting yeah, I think that's, I think that's a big part of it and kind of an insecurity. Um, and a lot of, a lot of people are not necessarily taught, like they'll learn flamenco choreographies mm -hmm. and, and they won't learn the musical structures. And so um, I think that kind of evening that out, mm -hmm. if, um, helps people become more secure and mm -hmm. and when they start to understand the structures more which can seem really confusing at first and they are very complicated mm -hmm. but that gives the security to then like build their own stuff yeah. but yeah, i think fear is in the like i have to be perfect in this form and it's like well no one's perfect in the form and yeah yeah do you yeah. um oh go ahead sure Oh, yeah. No, just that idea of being able to say, okay, no, I don't know, but tell me. And I think there's that connection with the but tell me that I, for me, that kind of makes or breaks someone who is legitimately studying and trying to grow in a field that mm -hmm. I can just say, yeah, no, I don't know that. Right. <laughs> and then just let it go. Or I can say, okay, I don't know, but could someone like let me know or point me in the right direction? And that that willingness to say, okay, but I still I want to learn more, I want to do better, like Daryl said, goes back to that idea that we were talking about trying to work past the perfectionism, that mm -hmm. it's not even so much that I don't want to be perfect. It's just that I'm reconfiguring how I'm looking at it. Right. And instead of it just being that, oh, well, either we're all in or it's not going to work, that instead, okay, well, this is what I got right now, right. but I want more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do I need to do? What do you know that I don't know? How can I learn that? And then just looking for ways to keep building 
on top. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. What, um, you've talked a lot about the musical cues. I'm interested to know, like, how many musical cues are there? Are there steps to every musical cue that's different? Um, yeah. So, um, well, let's see. How do I want to explain this? Let me start at the beginning. <laughs> um, so flamenco is our art form we're talking about. Yeah. And within flamenco, there are dozens of different uh, musical styles. Mm-hmm. And we call them palos, which literally means sticks. So we've got a pile of sticks. Um, and each stick is a different musical style. Mm-hmm. And um, these palos are defined um, by what key they're in or what tones on the guitar, what tones of the voice. Uh, they're defined by the melody uh, and they're defined by the rhythm. So we have rhythms that are in 4-4 four, four time, 3-4 time. We have some a lot of rhythms that are a combination of 3-4 and 6-8 time um, that are each measures 12 counts long. So... For example, um, one of our 12 count rhythms, um, I'll do a, a style called Solea Probulerias. So it's 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's one, one measure. Um, but there's other styles that also share that. So another style called Alegrias has that same rhythm, but it's in a major key. Um, whereas Solea Pobulerias is uh, in our in Phrygian, um, neither major or minor, um, but sort of um, an Andalusian Phrygian. Um, so that's kind of, so first of all, we have all these different musical styles and, mm-hmm. and a dancer, a complete dancer has to be able to dance pretty much any of those styles and be familiar with the verses. And the verses give a lot of structure to each piece. Um, knowing the melodies of the verses, but, um, and this is something, this goes to, to, we're always learning in flamenco. So this guitarist I mentioned who was, um, who said she didn't have sort of, she was afraid to compose until recently. Um, her name is Maria Temo and she's, I've been working with her a lot on, on ear training skills because I had, um, I knew my verses because I would learn them and memorize them. And there were some parts of the like melody I I would know even if I didn't know the verse so I could react to it as a dancer Um, but she's been helping me sort of explore new ways of listening and and listening to the rhythm of the verse Um, so it's almost she has me basically like rap um, the the verses so I understand how they fit in rhythmically Mm -hmm. um, which is like opened up new ways um, of choreographing for me um, and also being able to tell um, what we call a caída, a fall in the verse, where it, it's there's kind of like this buildup and then it comes back down to a, a tonic note, this kind of like home note. Um, so I'd always been able to hear the caída, which signals to the dancer, the verse is coming to an end, we're coming to a close. Um, but I wasn't quite aware of, of how we were getting into that. And so she's been helping me with new ways to listen to that. Um, so let's see, I think maybe I got too detailed here, but um, so the dancer's job is, is to, in many ways, interpret the verse um, when the singer is singing and then really be listening um, and embodying and reacting to the verse um, rhythmically, tonally. Um, when the singer takes a breath, there's like a space for the dancer to respond basically. And, and the dancer can be more, um, use more percussive sounds, be it footwork or body percussion. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of within a verse, but then s- larger on sort of the macro scale, um, in each one of these musical styles, there's different ways to call in a verse. Um, there's different ways to sort of tie off a verse and there's, like infinite possibilities in, in a call for a verse. Um, but usually there's one part of it that, that um, is distinct, that sig- signals the musicians, I'm calling in a verse, I want you to sing for me. Um, but then there's also a lot of freedom within that. So um, 
one step we use, it'll have three really strong stomps, three gold bays, we call them. And with those three stomps, the singer knows like, okay, this is a call for me to start singing. When they finish this phrase, I need to start mm -hmm. singing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that kind of um, communication level too. Mm -hmm. So dancers listening to musicians, reacting to the musicians, the musicians have to react and support the dancers. Um, so everyone, no one's really in charge, um, even at any one time. Um, they have to, everyone, the musicians and dancers have to be really like locked in with each other. Um, and so, and within each musical structure, um, there's, there's usually, or within each musical style, um, there's a typical structure that most people know. Um, and so you know you're gonna be working within some variation of that structure um, with like an entrance, uh, some verses, a footwork section, and then sort of an ending to the dance. Um, so everyone, everyone in the, in the flamenco group um, has an idea of that structure, kind of the outline. Um, and then there's a lot of play within um, what could actually happen on stage, um, mm -hmm. even within that outline. Mm. Is that, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's cool. That it's like it could end up being this big, because Truly and I both love improv, right? <laughs> so this is the best. <laughs> like this is true, maybe improvisational performance score that you know you don't know. Because I mean, I guess I guess my second part of that, or or what I'm wondering, like, are there a lot of like when you're studying flamenco, or or like when you were on tour, how much of that was just this is a set choreography and how much of it was like we're just all jamming feel what you feel and we're gonna go out there and perform and feel what you feel and that's kind of like our <laughs> so um in the theater most of the time things are pretty set um well so with um so flamenco is traditionally as a dancer traditionally it's a solo art form right you can't mm -hmm. um it's hard to have multiple people improvising um, in, in the way flamenco improvisation is structured. So it was initially a solo art form, um, but then uh, there, as flamenco transitioned into the performing arts, um, and especially um, in the middle of the 1900s is when like flamenco companies really started to come into being and this idea of having five or 10 dancers on stage um, all doing a choreography together. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I toured, um, most of the pieces were completely set. Um, anytime you see kind of a group on, on stage, they're set. Um, even if it's, it could be a traditional flamenco choreography, um, and just with different formations with multiple people doing it. So then it does have to be set, but it still has all, it'll still have all those kind of, um, communicative steps in it. It'll still have like the call for the verse to come in, mm -hmm. um, even though they don't, really need that um because the singer knows they have to sing because it's choreographed yeah. um but that kind of improvisational structure then just is set in stone mm -hmm. but one thing that's cool is even in um like set and choreographed shows after the bows there's almost always what's called a fin de fiesta an end of the party mm -hmm. and that's usually totally improvised um and it gives them um, an opportunity for the dancers and the musicians to just jam and so they mm -hmm. always kind of go back um, to the improvised roots of flamenco and, and the jam session of flamenco. Um, yeah. That's almost every flamenco show has that at the end, the fin de fiesta. Mm. So that's, that's always there. Cool. When I tell you the people keep coming near this window, <laughs> y'all, look. <laughs> it's only when I'm about to unmute and then they come back and I'm like, man. Um, so before we let you go, because I know you have other meetings today because you're fancy like that <laughs> <laughs> you're fancy to me still so it counts um what are some things um i guess for lack of a better phrase moving forward that you would like to see happen with flamenco education in the states oh man uh <laughs> <laughs> no pressure though <laughs> You know, oh, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> I would just like to see 
I'd like to see more opportunities for people to learn flamenco, um, especially in higher education. Um, I think it gets, for a number of reasons, it gets written off. Um, there's more and more flamenco dancers getting MFAs though. So that's cool. So maybe there will be more flamenco in universities. Um, but let's see, flamenco in education. Ugh. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess I'd like to see more classes that teach the improvised structures, which is something I had growing up. We had um, what was called cuadro class, and the flamenco cuadro is the singers, the musicians, the dancers, and the people copying the rhythm. So in cuadro class, we uh, sort of had the opportunity to in a more kind of academic way, learn the structures, um, but then also try them out and, and kind of um, in a very safe setting, improvise dances and then analyze them after the fact. Um, and and it, it can be very scary when you're, it is very scary, it's still scary for me and I've done it a lot, um, to not know what's gonna happen when you get up to dance and what is the singer gonna sing and I'm gonna have to listen and react mm -hmm. to it and what if I'm late on my reaction and miss miss my opportunity to do the cool step I want to do, um, but maybe the cool step I want to do doesn't even fit with that verse. Like it's very nerve wracking. <laughs> so um, it was great to to have that kind of safe atmosphere where um, we could kind of try things out and analyze them afterwards. Um, and even even outside of that class, just growing up in Albuquerque, I had a lot of performance opportunities um, with live musicians. Um, so even on stage, I was I was learning and, and learning from my mistakes on stage. Um, first time I did a solo, I got off the music and couldn't get back off the music. It was a disaster. <laughs> um, but a lot of people don't have that opportunity with a live musician, um, that opportunity to fail and learn from it. So maybe, maybe my answer is actually, I want more live musicians. Because that's one thing in the US, um, there's a ton of flamenco dancers. Uh, lots and lots of flamenco dancers, more and more every day, more dancers are, are teaching. Um, and I think there's a lot of teachers teaching in this very well-rounded way of, of the music, the culture, and the dance steps. But if you don't have the chance to practice with a live musician, like maybe you should just learn choreographies and not bother with the musical structures. But the whole joy of flamenco and where it comes from is, is improvisation. So, but you need musicians for that. And, and I always say like, you can only be as good as your musicians. So if your musicians can't support the steps you're doing, um, it's gonna feel like you're dragging them along through a performance. And, and I've been there, done that, and it's exhausting. Um, and I think musicians can also feel the same way if, if they're, they're really talented and, and know what they're doing and a dancer isn't, they're kind of dragging the dancer along. Um, but I think we definitely lack, um, musicians that really understand flamenco in the U.S. and musicians that can really improvise and jam in flamenco are, are, are rare. And so that can be really challenging in, in learning to dance flamenco. Um, so that, that's what I want. I want more flamenco musicians. <laughs> like, I love it. Thank you so, so much for joining us again. It was great to have you, as always. <laughs> um, if you would be so kind as to let our listeners know where they can find you, find out more about you, and projects that you're working on and have coming up. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I direct a company called Abre Paso Flamenco. And if you're wondering, that is a word that I made up, um, but it comes from <laughs> the Spanish phrase, se abre paso, which means to make way, uh, to forge ahead, um, to make space. So abre paso, A-B-R-E-P-A-S-O. And you can find me at abrepaso.org or facebook.com slash abrepasoflamenco or Instagram um, at abrepasoflamenco. I think that's it. And... Unfortunately, right now, I don't have a lot of projects going on, 
Um, mostly yeah. I'm teaching. I teach Zoom classes. Um, I teach uh, both flamenco technique and I've been teaching a flamenco history class, which has been really popular um, and been really fun. Uh, and I teach in Cleveland as well at a couple different studios. So that's hopefully I'll be back in a theater sooner rather than later. <laughs> but <laughs> who knows? <Yeah>. But <sighs> At least there are some outlets, so yes. yeah. that's always good. Trying, trying very hard to always look at the positive now because it's still crazy. Yeah, it is, and I'll just say, I mean, you know, there's video and dance on film, but I'm a, I'm a live performer. Yeah. I'm not, I mean, I, I don't know. I've done some dance films, but it's just. Yeah. There, there's there's something different yeah. yeah yeah and if that is your preferred medium this is rough <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for sure all right thank you all for joining us again here at dance talk realness if you have any other questions that you want to pose to our guest alice or if you have any for me and daryl be sure to just drop them under the video on youtube or under the post on instagram make sure to like comment follow subscribe anywhere you can find us instagram facebook YouTube, Apple Podcasts, because, hey, I'm on point remembering these things now. And we will be sure to answer all of these questions. And we look forward to bringing you some fresh new content next week. See you then. Bye.